Hello, hello. Welcome everyone to today's talk hosted by the Center for Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma Research here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. My name is Joseph Mar Hernandez Antonio, and it is a pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Mason Marks. Dr. Marks is project lead of Harvard Law School's Project on Psychedelic Law and Regulation and is assistant law professor at the University of New Hampshire. He was recently appointed by the governor of Oregon to serve as a chair on the Psilocybin Advisory Board, which is drafting regulations for the state's emerging psilocybin service industry. Dr. Marks will be speaking to us today about the legal aspects of psilocybin regulation under city, state, and federal law. Please leave your questions in the Q&A box down below, and we will have some time at the end of the talk to uh, address all of them. So without further ado, I will now turn over the floor to Dr. Marks. So I'm going to talk about state regulation of psilocybin. Um, I am a law professor at the University of New Hampshire. Franklin Pierce School of Law. I also run this new center that I'll talk a little bit about. So this is the Project on Psychedelics Law and Regulation, which we founded in June. And prior to that, uh, last year, I was a fellow at the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. And part of my responsibilities was to put on academic panels each semester and some of the panels I was interested in, in hosting were related to psychedelics, law and policy. And I was a little bit concerned about bringing this up to my superiors at the law school. I didn't know how they would react to it. There's still a lot of stigma associated with psychedelics in medicine and especially in law, which is a, in many ways a very conservative field. But I brought it up and they were very enthusiastic. And these panels turned out to be some of the most popular events that they had ever hosted at the center. And I noticed that there were a lot of academic centers cropping up around the country and the world focused on clinical use of psychedelics. And I noticed that there was a lack of any systematic research on the law and ethics related to psychedelics regulation. And so that was what I proposed, a center uh, that was focused on this problem. And the idea is that you can do all of the clinical research that you want, and there's a lot of exciting research being done now, but unless you also address the law that uh, is really what I think of as a, a bottleneck to progress in this area, you're not going to see the, the progress that we need in the research and commercialization of these therapies. And the reason that that's so important is that we are legitimately in a mental health crisis right now. This is the trend for US overdose deaths, which have increased significantly in the past 20 years or so. And if you were to look at the very last couple of years, you'd see an exponential increase in overdoses related to synthetic opioids like fentanyl. So this is a really serious problem as I'm sure you're all aware. And during this time, we've also seen a steady increase in US suicide rates. And um, they've, got, they've actually gone up in some populations during the COVID pandemic. There's some information that suicide rates may have actually gone down in others, but overall, the situation has been worsened by the pandemic. So something, something's been going terribly wrong for the past 20 years. Our, our trends are headed in the wrong direction. And unfortunately, during this time, we haven't seen the innovation in mental health care that we really need to see to help address this problem. And so I like to show this slide just to put things in perspective a bit so ECT is a therapy that was introduced in the 1930s and popularized in the 1940s. Many of you here may have uh, prescribed this therapy or actually uh, done the therapy. And uh, I did this in medical school, held the electrodes to someone's head and, and, and administered the, the shock. And it, it, 
you know, it seems like a fairly barbaric procedure, but it actually is quite effective. And it's quite striking, I think, that we still use this therapy 80 years later. And it's actually one of the more effective ways to address treatment resistant depression. Of course, in the 1950s, we saw the introduction of tricyclic antidepressants. And more recently, in the 80s, Prozac was introduced, the first selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. These drugs have been very helpful for many people, but they leave a lot to be desired because a significant portion of people who try them, even who try many SSRIs in, in, a, in a series, receive an inadequate benefit. So a lot of people are left untreated. As you know, these drugs often have either uh, uncomfortable or dangerous side effects. And so there's a lot of room for improvement. And that's why, at least in part, people are very excited about psychedelics like psilocybin. And I really like to show this quote, uh, which is um, uh, from psychiatrist Stanislav Grof, psychedelics used responsibly and with proper caution would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine or the telescope for astronomy. So this is a pretty bold claim and we don't of course know yet whether this is true, but I think it's possibly true. It's very likely true. The evidence suggests that there's something different about psychedelics. There's evidence supporting their use in addressing a variety of mental health conditions like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, anxiety toward the end of life and many substance use conditions. So it's quite possible this could be true. They could represent a, a real paradigm shift in how both uh, neuroscience research is conducted and how psychiatry is conducted as a field, but you know, it's still early days. One of the most exciting psychedelics that I'm going to focus on today is psilocybin. And it's interesting because this is a substance that's both incredibly new to many scientists and to the field of psychiatry, but it's also very ancient because though psilocybin was first synthesized less than 100 years ago, it occurs naturally in over 200 species of fungi that grow around the world. Um, I'm in Oregon, uh, Portland, Oregon right now, and psilocybin mushrooms grow here. People actually go out and look for them. And so it's interesting that uh, this is something that could revolutionize mental health care, but it's also been around for millennia. Now, psilocybin services is uh, something that's also called uh, psilocybin therapy, perhaps in the, in the medical field. I, I like to call it psilocybin services, which is how we refer to it in Oregon usually consists of three phases. There's a preparatory session where a patient or in Oregon, a, a client is, uh, meets, with a, meets with a facilitator and the client is prepared for the, this journey that they'll go on during the administration session. And so this is where informed consent would likely be obtained and the process of administering the psychedelic would be described. And then during the administration session, which can last six to eight hours, uh, depending on how rapidly the person metabolizes psilocybin, um, that is where the person experiences this psychedelic experience and the facilitator is there to make sure everything goes smoothly and that the, the client is comfortable. And then the integration session occurs afterwards where the facilitator and the client sort of talk through this experience and try to make sense of it. And I'm sure you've seen some of the really impressive results that are coming out of clinical trials. Participants often describe a sustained decrease in, in depression and anxiety. Sometimes these benefits last for many months, six months or more. People often described increased life satisfaction during that period and an increased acceptance of mortality. A lot of this information comes from these studies involving people with life-threatening conditions. 
So I'm a law professor. I like to think a lot about how substances like psilocybin are regulated. Psilocybin, like most other psychedelics that uh, typically come to mind, are Schedule One controlled substances, both at the state and federal level. And so that means that according to the federal government and the Drug Enforcement Agency, they have no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. But it turns out that for most of the psychedelics in Schedule One, and particularly for psilocybin, that just isn't true. Psilocybin is clearly miscategorized as a Schedule One controlled substance. It's actually thought to be a very safe substance with very low toxicity and a low potential for addiction or dependence. It was actually never criminalized in some countries like Jamaica, Portugal decriminalized all drugs, including psilocybin and other psychedelics in 2001, and has had success with that approach. And in the Netherlands, people can actually purchase psilocybin containing fungi and other psychedelics as well over the counter. And people usually don't have to show any identification. There's no information exchange. They just buy the fungi and leave. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. The FDA granted psilocybin its breakthrough therapy designation for treating both treatment resistant depression and major depressive disorder. So that means that psilocybin assisted therapy very likely represents a significant improvement over existing therapies like the SSRIs. And psilocybin has completed phase two clinical trials with hundreds of patients. A, a, a British company, Compass Pathways, recently completed a large, the largest phase two trial with, um, I think, a little over 200 patients. Regulation in other countries is a little bit more advanced than it is here in the US. For example, Canada allows people to access psilocybin through compassionate use legislation and also through an exemption to its national drug law, the equivalent of our, our um, Controlled Substances Act. But I have heard from some people in Canada that even though these pathways exist, right now they are overloaded with applications to access psilocybin in this way. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily the best solution. And then here in the United States, there's an interesting lawsuit right now that is ongoing between some physicians in Washington state who are trying to gain access to psilocybin for their patients who have cancer and other life-threatening conditions. And they're trying to gain access through right to try laws, both state and federal right to try laws. And so they've sued the Drug Enforcement Administration or DEA. And the position of the DEA is that uh, right to try does not apply to schedule one controlled substances. And they've even taken the position that these physicians should just go ahead and break the law. And then if they are uh, prosecuted for doing so, they should uh, object at that point. So um, it's interesting to see where this case goes. I'm not particularly optimistic about the uh, physicians and patients succeeding. And uh, it's an interesting case because the DEA has a lot of discretion. I think it's pretty clear that it is within their power to, to grant this uh, access through right to try, but it's not the course of action that the DEA has decided to take. This is a picture from a, what's called a smart shop in the Netherlands. And um, if you're ever in the Netherlands, particularly in Amsterdam, you should really go into one of these smart shops. There's quite a lot of them. And uh, it's just a lot of fun to look at the different substances that are available for purchase. These are different species of psilocybin containing fungi. They're, it's a particular uh, part of the life cycle of the fungus called sclerotia, or they're sometimes called truffles. And you can, you know, people claim that these different species have different uh, effects. You can see there's sort of like a rating scale 
of uh, saying, you know, this, this has more of a visual, more of an effect on your visual system. This affects your body. This affects your brain. I don't know if any of that is true or not, but it's just quite interesting to compare how these substances are regulated in, in, uh, by the Dutch compared to in the US. And in 2011, the Dutch Ministry of Health actually commissioned a scientific study to determine the public health risk of the availability of these mushrooms. At the time, people could buy mu uh, actual mushrooms. That, that has since been banned. And so this, these sclerotia, these truffles are the only form that is available. But the results of this study should still apply. And it's quite interesting. It found that the use of these mushrooms rarely, if ever, leads to physical or psychological dependence. If there are adverse effects, they're usually fairly mild and infrequent. And this actually mirrors the results of clinical trials where there are some mild adverse effects like anxiety, nausea, but these tend to resolve. They, they don't persist and they tend to be mild. The study found that the, uh, there were very minimal effects on public health. There was not a, uh, an associated rise uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, criminal activity or trafficking. They said it was almost non-existent and they thought, you know, this could be an attractive option to make it available especially if it was um, only provided in a, um, an environment designed for that purpose. I think that's pretty interesting because right now that is not a requirement in the Netherlands. You can just go into a store and buy them. But the Oregon system that I'll talk about in a moment uh, does provide psilocybin only in a specially designed environment where it's administered under supervision of a facilitator licensed by the Oregon Health Authority. So there's been a lot of excitement around psilocybin and psilocybin containing mushrooms. Denver, Colorado was the first US city to effectively legalize them. Uh, and uh, it passed an ordinance in 2019, making the investigation, arrest, and prosecution of people for possessing psilocybin mushrooms, the lowest law enforcement priority in the city. And then something really incredible happened last November during the presidential election. There were a number of ballot measures that passed. For example, uh, Washington DC decriminalized psychedelics, Oregon decriminalized effectively all drugs, uh, kind of taking the uh, following the example of Portugal. And Oregon also passed Measure 109, which is called the Oregon uh, Psilocybin Services Act, which legalized, um, this article is calling them uh, therapeutic psilocybin, but technically it's, psil it's psilocybin services. And I'll talk uh, a little bit more in a moment about whether that should be thought of as a, um, a medical therapy or not. But this ballot measure passed, as you can see, by a, by a fairly healthy margin. And what that did is that created this two-year development process that we're now in. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little more detail in a second. But first, I like to show this slide of all the different states that have put forth similar legislation. Some of it has been modeled directly after Measure 109. For example, Florida's bill was inspired by Measure 109. Um, a lot of these bills have not really gone anywhere and, and Florida is, is one example, but it's still quite meaningful that that was put forward. Other states like Massachusetts, Texas, and Connecticut, uh, also Pennsylvania as well as the most recent bill these are focused more on research. So instead of creating an industry where people can go and access psilocybin, they have created an, uh, uh, effectively a framework to investigate the potential benefits of psilocybin. So in Texas, they actually allotted, I think about $1.5 million for a psilocybin trial to be conducted. And, uh, Pennsylvania is trying to set up 
sort of a, a almost like a clinical trial process that's outside of the FDA. So there's a lot of interest in this. And then if you look on the local side of things, there are 12 US cities, arguably, arguably 13, but definitely at least 12 that have decriminalized psychedelics, including psilocybin. The most recent is Detroit, which, which decriminalized just a couple days ago. Arcata, California and Seattle, Washington came before that. I actually was the primary drafter of the resolution that was passed in Seattle. And that happened um, just about a month ago. So that was very exciting to see that happen in uh, the largest city to date. So this is really a, a national phenomenon in which cities are kind of, you know, not willing to wait for the FDA to approve psilocybin. That's likely, very likely to happen but it's likely still several years in the future. And so these cities and states are watching people in their populations die unnecessarily. They see an opportunity to, to do something, to take matters into their own hands and make these substances available to people who can potentially benefit. So uh, I mentioned that the passage of Measure 109 last year, uh, it, it created this a two-year development period that started on January 1st of this year. And in March, Governor Kate Brown appointed members to the Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board, which sits within the state public health organization, which is the Oregon Health Authority. And during this two-year development period, this advisory board is meeting very regularly. We have sometimes two or three meetings a week. There's three meetings this week, actually. One later this afternoon that I lead, which is the licensing subcommittee. Tomorrow we have a meeting of the, of the training subcommittee. And so we're meeting very frequently to talk about the rules that should be adopted by the Oregon Health Authority to govern this emerging psilocybin industry. And you can see that you know, there's a variety of types of people on this advisory board. Many of them are healthcare providers of different types. We have several physicians, a naturopathic doctor, some therapists. I believe there's a, uh, a nurse practitioner. There's a physical therapist. We have a couple attorneys, academic researchers, public health experts, and we have a, a, an academic mycologist as well. There are these five subcommittees that meet uh, as often as twice a month. Some meet once a month. I chair the licensing subcommittee. Uh, I, I attend most of these meetings. They're open to the public. If you're interested about what's going on, I, I definitely uh, recommend that you check them out. This is a timeline that I mentioned. So um, the governor appointed the advisory board in February. We met for the first time in March. And then in June of next year, the board will make its recommendations to the Oregon Health Authority. And the idea is that by January 2023, the Health Authority will start accepting license applications for all of the businesses and professionals that will be operating in this industry. So that includes psilocybin cultivators, manufacturers, so these are um, people who are maybe extracting psilocybin from psilocybin mushrooms, or they may be uh, producing other types of products. There's been a lot of discussion about accessibility for people with disabilities and the different types of products that may increase access. There will be testing labs, and then there will be service centers, which is the, the site at which psilocybin has to be administered at a licensed psilocybin service center as well as psilocybin facilitators who are the people that administer the psilocybin and then sit with the client as they um, have their psychedelic experience. So this is that quote I just wanted to return to again that psychedelics may be uh, you know, this uh, like a research tool, kind of like the microscope for biology, uh, the telescope for astronomy and Again, we, you know, we don't know this is true. I think it's very likely to be true, but um, 
an area that I've become increasingly interested in is the, uh, the patent and, uh, and intellectual property side of the emerging psychedelics landscape. And uh, the question is, if psychedelics do really represent this paradigm shift for research and clinical medicine, do we want a small number of companies uh, peppering the landscape with patents that are often overly broad such that they are able to control the emerging industry? And what does that potentially do to the industry I didn't really get into this too much, but uh, psychedelics were studied by academic researchers in the 1950s and 60s, and they published a lot of articles in mainstream journals. But in the 1970s, uh, President Nixon launched the US War on Drugs, Congress passed the Controlled Substances Act in 1970, uh, that made psychedelics schedule one controlled substances and all of that research that was just getting off the ground came to a halt. And so there was no progress in this area effectively for decades until the 1990s when some researchers gained permission to start studying psychedelics again. And then really in the past decade, especially the past few years, we've just seen a, a flurry of activity in this space. But there are a lot of patents being filed, an increasing number of patents, it seems. Um, the top two patents here, I know you can't, you probably can't read this, but the top two patents were granted to Compass Pathways and they cover different um, crystalline formulations of psilocybin, what are called polymorphs. And um, the patent on the bottom left is for a deuterated form of psilocybin where the hydrogen atoms are replaced with deuterium atoms, so a different form of hydrogen. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a patent on a method, a method patent on treating food allergies with psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin. And there are problems with a lot of these patents. Um, if you, don't, if you don't know too much about patent law, I would just say that there are certain requirements. There are actually many requirements to obtain a patent, but some of the fundamental patents are, uh, some of the fundamental requirements are that the invention has to be novel, so it has to be new. It has to be non-obvious, which means that a person having ordinary skill in the relevant field would find the invention sufficiently inventive it's, uh, it wouldn't have been obvious to that person. There has to be a certain utility to the invention, although that requirement has kind of fallen by the wayside and it's really a minimal requirement at this point. <clears throat> and then inventors have to describe the invention adequately uh, in the patent documents. And there are many other requirements, but those are some of the, the basic requirements. And arguably a lot of these patents are not novel, and they are also not, uh, they are also not non-obvious, which is the way that um, a patent attorney would refer to the, that uh, obviousness issue. I wanna to return to this idea of the crystalline formulations of psilocybin that have been patented recently. Compass Pathways um, just obtained a patent a couple of weeks ago from the patent office on its second crystalline formulation. These images are actually different crystal, crystalline structures of water. So, uh, so this is uh, different types of ice um, that form. And so these are different interactions between water molecules. And I show this just to give an example that there are many, many different um, uh, polymorphs of ice. And similarly, there are different polymorphs of psilocybin. So the psilocybin molecules can come together in different, these different configurations. And that is what uh, Compass has patented together with various um, excipients that go into a, uh, a drug uh, and, and including like a capsule or a tablet. That's what the patent consists of. Now, um, it's a, it's a big question whether that, that, that patent has actually been issued by the patent office. Uh, 
but it's a big question whether that is actually a novel invention and whether it is non-obvious because people have been synthesizing psilocybin for decades, many decades, and it's very likely that they have produced these exact crystalline structures. And so um, there will likely be a lot of discussion about these patents and whether they should have been granted. Another example I like to talk about is, is the patenting of uh, enantiomers. So in addition to polymorph patents, it's common practice to patent enantiomers of different molecules. In this case, I'm talking about enantiomers of ketamine. So ketamine is another psychedelic. Um, some people don't like to categorize it as a psychedelic because it's not a classic psychedelic, but I definitely call it a psychedelic. And uh, it was discovered in recent years that ketamine could be very useful potentially for treating treatment resistant depression. Ketamine of course is used routinely in anesthesia and it's, uh, it's an essential medicine. It's on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. It's prescribed every day, often to children. It's, it's particularly safe in pediatric populations. And so it's quite useful and it's this use in psychiatry has recently been discovered and popularized. Ketamine, of course, is available as a generic, and so the drug is quite inexpensive. And these, you may be familiar with these ketamine clinics that have cropped up. Sometimes it can be expensive to visit one of these clinics. A single infusion of ketamine might cost $500 uh, minimum, but the price can go up to several thousand dollars per administration. But what you're usually paying for there is the provider's time. It's often an anesthesiologist or a psychiatrist that's administering ketamine. And so you're paying for their time. The actual drug itself is quite inexpensive. Ketamine is a racemic mixture of two enantiomers. So the left-handed version of ketamine or S-ketamine and the right-handed enantiomer or um, uh, ketamine itself are present in equal parts in a solution of ketamine. And so they're just uh, uh, mere images of each other. And what happened is that uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals took notice of this and they said, well, we're gonna isolate the left-handed molecule as ketamine. We're gonna patent that. We're gonna get FDA approval of it for treatment resistant depression. They've done that. And their drug is uh, Spravato which is S-ketamine in, in a nasal spray. And um, so now they've, they, and, and I should point out, there's, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that S-ketamine is any more effective than ketamine. Uh, so they've effectively taken a drug that is extremely inexpensive and um, patented it and created a monopoly on that therapy. And what that does is, um, it disincentivizes clinicians from using ketamine or doing research on ketamine. And so it's, it's likely increasing the obstacles in the way of research and access for people unnecessarily. They haven't really created anything new or particularly useful, at least that, that doesn't seem to be the case based on current evidence. So there's a concern that something similar could happen with other psychedelics like psilocybin and that we're, go we're quickly going down that path where we'll, we'll find that we're trapped in a similar type of situation where um, there isn't all that much innovation for decades. Uh, we could end up with a situation where drug companies that create psychedelics, they basically have a monopoly on many different types of treatments and they're not incentivized to innovate. They have effectively become gatekeepers in this field. Now, there are other jurisdictions that limit patents on things like polymorphs and enantiomers. The UN Development Program issued guidelines some years ago that recommended a presumption against the patentability of polymorphs and enantiomers. The Indian Patent Act of 1970 says that you actually have to show that the enantiomer uh, or the polymorph is, is a significant improvement. Otherwise, they're going to treat it as the same substance. But we don't do that here in the United States. 
And then um, I just have a couple more slides I'll wrap up in a moment. But another concern in this area is biopiracy. A lot of these psychedelics are used by indigenous communities. Biopiracy, I like to define as commercializing indigenous knowledge without adequate acknowledgement or compensation. Psilocybin is used by indigenous people in Mexico. Peyote is used by Native American churches throughout the United States. Uh, ibogaine is used by practitioners of the Buiti religion in Central Africa. And ayahuasca, of course, is used in um, South America. And I think um, I'll just kind of wrap up by saying that we're seeing a lot of low quality patents passing through the patent office. There are a variety of reasons about that. We can talk about that in the discussion if you'd like. Um, part of it is just the fact that these substances have been prohibited for many years. So I think there's a lack of experts at the patent office that are familiar with them. They, they're not able to tell necessarily when a psychedelic patent should be uh, not be approved. So I think I'll end there. I'm excited to, to get into the conversation. Thanks again for having me. It's great to chat with you about this topic. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Marks. Um, so we're going to open up the floor for questions now. Um, if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, and I'll invite you up to uh, ask it on camera. Um, so. Um, in the meantime, while you're doing that, I can start. I, um, I have a question, I can jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for a really educational lecture. Um, and yeah, I was wondering, if there are particular conditions that combine um, that make certain cities more likely or more successful in decriminalizing psilocybin, and also what are some compelling reasons um, that you've seen why cities decide not to or why it ultimately fails? So that's a good question. I, I I'm not aware of too many cities that have tried to do this and failed. Um, I have seen states that have tried. And uh, so example, the, the bill in Florida uh, was modeled after Oregon's Measure 109. It was advanced by um, Michael Greco, who's a congressman in Miami. And it actually had some interesting innovations, uh, 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 differences from 109. For example, it talked about potentially using telehealth for some of those stages of the psilocybin services. And I thought that was really interesting. Like you could do a preparatory session or an integration session uh, remotely, but um, it didn't really get very far. And that's not terribly surprising because this is happening in Florida, which is not very welcoming to drug policy reform. Uh, it's been very difficult to get cannabis reform in Florida. And so, you know, psychedelics reform is, is uh, maybe asking a little bit too much, at least at this stage, but there are a lot of people working to change that right now. So, you know, it's, it's basically likely the, uh, the local politics, but something interesting is that I, I, I think this is really a, a bipartisan issue and it's, it's very revealing that Texas has embraced psychedelics research in many ways. And, um, there is, a, there is psychedelics research occurring in conservative states, including South Carolina. Um, so, you know, that may not be the, the ultimate reason. And I think this is something that can be of great interest to, to anyone. Great, next we have Kathleen. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Okay, yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Dr. Marks. Um, so regarding patents that have already been granted to psychedelic drugs or methods that aren't novel or non-obvious, are, um, are there any mechanisms to retroactively retract a mistakenly granted patent? Yeah, so traditionally you would have to do that in the courts. Um, and the problem is that 
that can be incredibly expensive. It can easily cost millions of dollars in order to do that. And so that's one reason that these patents, um, even though they are not particularly strong, they can still do a lot of damage. So I, I've talked to some patent scholars who say, oh, this is not that big a deal because you know, if the patent's weak, that will be taken care of and uh, through the courts and that's the system acting as designed. But the problem is if a patent holder comes after you for patent infringement and you're a smaller company and you don't have you know, the, the funds to defend yourself, even a weak patent can do a lot of damage. You know, it can, it can uh, people can be intimidated um, and even pushed out of business. There are some other mechanisms at the patent office that allow um, anyone to challenge a patent. The, the bar is a little bit lower, and uh, but but it's it's uh, it's time limited. I think I think it's uh, I think you might have nine months or so to challenge a patent. So. For this particular one that was recently issued, the clock is already ticking and somebody would have to do that fairly quickly. So there's no, um, right now, there's no perfect um, you know, avenue to do that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, what is the process for challenging a patent? Like, would you really need a lot of expertise and a team of lawyers to do that? Or is that something that, uh, you know, a, kind of a common person could do? Oh yeah, it becomes a very, very technical battle to, you know, you have, you have to really get into the, the details of the technology. And so you certainly need uh, technical expertise and legal expertise. Okay, thanks for the info. Yeah, that's helpful to know. Okay, so our next question comes from an anonymous attendee. So I'll go ahead and ask this. Uh, I didn't understand how patenting S-ketamine inhibits use of the generic. Can you explain? Yeah, so one reason is that the patented version is the FDA approved version, and it is also the version that's most likely to be reimbursed by insurance. So it's not a guarantee that it would be reimbursed, reimbursable, but for that reason, because you, you could prescribe ketamine off-label. If it's used for depression, it's prescribed off-label. That's fine, that's perfectly legal, but some providers might feel more comfortable utilizing the FDA approved variety, which would be in this case, S-ketamine, and then also there's the potential to, for, for it to be reimbursed. And so that's what um, disincentivizes the use of ketamine. Our next question uh, is, comes from Randy Ellis. Um, how influential have arguments related to cognitive liberty been on legislation related to the decriminalization and compassionate use of psychedelics? And do you envision them playing a more prominent role as time goes on? I would say that they have not been very successful um, and not particularly persuasive. I don't like to use them. I think it's a great justification. I fully agree that people should have cognitive liberty. It's persuasive to me, but I think that it's generally one of the weaker arguments. Um, but I do think that could potentially change. Um, and I'm very interested in novel ways of framing that argument. And so I do think it could become more of a, of a central uh, part of these campaigns. Um, and, um, also religious liberty as well is, is a, a big part of, um, is another rapidly emerging trend. And there are churches cropping up or coming out of the woodwork that are attempting to gain permission to use these substances. But that's a great question. I think typically it has not been the best um, foundation on which to base your, your, your claims. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, comes from an attendee who uh, I think is not in the talk anymore, but uh, I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, 
Um, why would RTT be considered rather than a compassion use expanded access request? So my understanding is that um, compassionate use and expanded access. So that's more burdensome, I believe, on the patient. And I think there's more discretion um, on the side of uh, healthcare providers. And so you have, there's, there, that places a great burden on the patient if they do wanna access a substance that way. There are also limits. So right now, I believe MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies has permission to grant expanded access to, to MDMA for treating PTSD, but there's a, they only have permission to do that for a certain number of people. And so there's, there's, there's constraints placed on it. Right to Try doesn't have those limitations. And I think the idea is that it's, it, it's supposed to be a right. It's more of a right. Um, and so um, I think that's why some people prefer to take that path. Thank you. Um, our next question is from another anonymous attendee. Um, how would that's you? The, that's the stigma at play, right? You know, this is this is, a, <laughs> this is the problem with criminalizing these substances. We can't uh, speak about them openly. Very good point. Um, this question reads: How would you approach addressing the stigma? and societal mysticism around drugs and psychiatric conditions. Uh, additionally, you mentioned biopiracy, but what possible solutions or insights have you thought about concerning uplifting indigenous populations or POC that have been ostracized from using drugs? So the stigma is a huge problem. Um, I wrote my first law review article. Uh, so this is a, an academic article for a legal journal about this in um, 2018. It's called um, Psychedelic Medicine, Social and Legal Obstacles, something like that. Uh, and so I really look at the role that the stigma has played in uh, preventing research and it continues to inhibit research and access so what do we do about it? I mean, you have to really, uh, it, education is what you do, education and talking about these things and really looking at why our legal system is structured this way. Why, why is it easy, to, why, why can substances be categorized in schedule one based on totally anecdotal evidence and barely any of it? Uh, that it's very, very easy to, um, place something in schedule one. And, and who decides that? The uh, US Attorney General, so a law enforcement, the, the country's top law enforcement officer gets to decide unilaterally. It, it's, uh, well, actually that's not entirely true. The FDA and uh, the Department of Health and Human Services have a say, um, but fundamentally it's a, it's a law enforcement decision. But then if you wanna take a substance out of schedule one, you need a, a mountain of evidence. And, and what happens is courts and the DEA, they treat FDA approval as though it's the same as the requirements for rescheduling a substance. They're, they're different. They're, they're not the same, but they get confused and um, intermingled together in ways that they shouldn't. So just like looking at these processes and asking, does this make any sense? You know, how can psilocybin be in schedule one when all the evidence suggests that it does not, it just does not have a high potential for abuse. That's just clearly false. It's not true. And yet it remains there. So just talking about these things, kind of unraveling the, uh, the misinformation that was spread in the 1970s and that continues to be um, spread uh, talking about these things. 
The biopiracy issue is very difficult. This is not a, a new problem. It's not unique to psychedelics, but I think it's particularly troubling in the context of psychedelics because um, psychedelics often play a role that is central to the identity of some of these communities. It's like a, a sacred, uh, sacred rituals, sacred spiritual practices uh, utilize psychedelics in a very central way. And so that, I think that makes it particularly offensive to take these practices and commercialize them without uh, acknowledgement or compensation. And it may even be a safety issue because I think oftentimes the practices of these communities, they've been honed over thousands of years and they actually do, um, they create you know, what people call a container, the appropriate container for these psychedelic experiences. And that should be acknowledged. Um, so, but some of the things that we're talking about, I have another article out very recently. Well, one article came out in, um, in Nature Medicine uh, where we talk a little bit about psychedelics. And then um, we have a new article coming out in the Harvard Law Review Forum. And um, that focuses almost entirely on patents. It's called uh, Patents on Psychedelics, the Next Legal Battlefront of Drug Development. And there are a couple different approaches that are being taken. So one of them, which is just starting, is to have these repositories of what's called prior art in patent law. So these are, this could be anything. It's just, it could be, it could be other patents. It could be articles. It could be any kind of document. It could be presentations, lectures, books that uh, describe a technology. And if that technology is described, you cannot get a patent on it if there's, if there's what's called relevant prior art. The problem is that a lot of this indigenous knowledge might be very difficult for patent examiners at the patent office to find, because first of all, it might be, it might be in another language that they're not familiar with or not, it's not easily accessible. It might be something that's handed down orally through the generations, and so it's not written down. Um, so a lot of it can be uh, very obscure, difficult to find. And so creating these repositories of this indigenous knowledge, a, a database that contains it uh, can be helpful in um, helping inventors and patent agents to find the relevant prior art. Then there are other ideas. Um, I'll just mention one or two more. One of them is uh, the idea of a patent pledge. So a patent pledge is an agreement from different inventors or, pa or patent holders that they won't enforce their patents. So for example, Tesla, which is now the most profitable auto company in history, uh, took a patent pledge years ago. And Elon Musk said, we're not going to exert our patent rights over people or companies who use our electric vehicle technology in good faith. We won't go after you. There's a COVID, open COVID pledge where companies, many, many different types of companies, including Facebook, said we won't use our patents against you if you utilize them to address the COVID-19 pandemic. So people are talking about a similar type of patent pledge for psychedelics where we could incentivize companies to agree that they won't exert their patent rights against you if you utilize them in good faith. I think that that can be very effective. The problem is, it's not entirely clear whether a patent pledge is legally enforceable. So Compass, for example, one of their uh, uh, officers made a public statement that Compass would not be enforcing its patents on uh, related to set and setting, so the environment in which psychedelics are administered. And um, it was sort of an offhand remark. And so it's unclear whether that would be a legally binding promise um, or not. And another problem with patent pledges is they, they leave a lot of discretion to the patent holder. They ultimately control access. They can change their mind uh, if it's not a legally binding promise. And so um, it's an imperfect solution, but an interesting one that could help address this problem of uh, biopiracy. Our next question comes from Alex. Alex, would you like to come up on camera? Sure, thank you. Uh, and thanks for being here. I was wondering, so 
Uh, it seems like there right now there's two paths for psychedelic uh, treatment and access to that um, the kind of the local legalization like in Oregon or in, or in cities and then the kind of FDA medicalization and insurance coverage. Do you think moving forward those will largely be the two paths that, that people will have access to psychedelic treatments go, uh, going forward and do you think those two paths can exist peacefully or do you think there's going to be a, a lot of tension between the two? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the third path is the religious pathway. So seeking religious exemptions to the Controlled Substances Act. There's absolutely no reason why these different approaches should not or cannot coexist. Um, we already have this with respect to um, cannabis. So this kind of shows you how little sense the controlled substances schedule makes. THC, the, one of the active ingredients in cannabis, currently exists in three different schedules in the controlled substances list. It's in uh, uh, natural cannabis is in, uh, and, and THC is in schedule one. And there are two FDA approved medicines that are in schedule two and schedule three. Uh, and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because really you're just putting the THC into a capsule and then suddenly, you know, it's, it's a different, in a different schedule. Um, but we, that's the system we currently have. So we have, um, medical cannabis in, um, most States at this point, and, um, you can also access these FDA approved versions of THC and that works. And there's, there's no reason not to allow that. Um, and if, if you're following the FDA closely, I don't, I don't mean to, um, uh, dismiss the importance of FDA approval in any way, but the, the FDA is uh, embroiled in a lot of controversy right now and its reputation is not very good. And so, you know, do we really want the FDA acting as, as the gatekeeper of substances that really shouldn't have been prohibited in the first place? I mean, we have a, there, there are literally thousands of natural substances like uh, supplements that people can just buy freely. You know, there's no reason to restrict them. The same is likely true of psychedelics, but we can have that FDA approval pathway uh, as a parallel path that's very important, obviously, but they can and should coexist. Amazing. Okay, so uh, it is almost 1 p.m. Um, I'll remind everyone that we do have our informal discussion slash social uh, today at five, tonight at 5.30, um, come one and all. Uh, Dr. Marks, thank you so much for taking the time to come on here and uh, share your expertise with us. We really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And with Feel that, free to I wish everyone... Oh. Feel that? free to get in touch if I, if I can be of any help. Um, uh, everyone's uh, welcome to contact me. All right. And with that, I wish everyone a very uh, lovely rest of your day. Bye.